What's up my comic comrades? The Black Knight just made his big screen debut in the Eternals movie, so you know we wouldn't leave you guys without a rundown of his comic book history. The Black Knight has been around for quite some time, but he's by no means an A-lister for Marvel. At least not yet, because the MCU tends to make C-list characters A-listers. Case in point, Iron Man, Guardians of the Galaxy, Shang-Chi, and the list goes on. So I have little doubt that the Black Knight will join that list, especially with Jon Snow, I mean Kit Harington, bringing the character to life in such a cool way. With that said, let's learn about Marvel's Medieval Knight. Black Knight first appeared in The Avengers 47 in December of 1967 as a villain, before making his first Dane Whitman hero appearance in the next issue, The Avengers issue 48. Don't worry, the whole villain and then hero thing will be explained in Origins. Anyway, Dane Whitman Black Knight was created by Roy Thomas, John Vaporton, and artist George Tuska. But besides that, there's not a whole lot to say about the character's real-world creation without getting into his fictional origins, so let's do just that. The man that would become the Black Knight we all know and love is Dane Whitman. He was born in Massachusetts and earned a master's degree in physics while in college. We also learn in the Avengers issues 47 and 48 that he's the descendant of a long line of heroes who would take up the moniker of Black Knight. We learn in Avengers issue 47 while Dr. Whitman is working on an experiment, he's telling his assistant Norris about his late uncle, Professor Nathan Garrett, saying he led a strange double life as a biologist and as a super criminal called the Black Knight. He continues to say some months ago he had his final encounter with the Invincible Iron Man, which we actually see go down in Tales of Suspense issue 73. Anyway, Whitman goes on to say, using the last surge of depleted transistor power, Iron Man pulled both winged horse and rider down to Earth until they came crashing to the ground. But fortunately, the Golden Avenger evaded death by plummeting into a stream below, and his lightweight armor enabled him to swim to shore. Whitman keeps elaborating, saying, later Iron Man found his uncle's cloak, but the Black Knight was never heard from again, at least not by mankind at large. The rest of the world knows that Professor Garrick is dead, but not that he was the villain known as the Black Knight. Whitman's assistant then says, but that still doesn't explain why you drive yourself so hard with these magnetic experiments. Whitman replies, doesn't it? I suppose not to someone like you who only works for money. I've sworn to make up for my uncle's deeds by doing something of value for the science which he used only for evil. That's why I can't stop now, not when I'm so terribly close. Later on in the issue, we see Whitman tell Norris, activate the electro stabilizer. But Norris replies by knocking him out, saying, that was your final command to me, Whitman. You'll never order me to do anything ever again. So clearly Norris was holding in a lot of hatred and resentment that he just decided to let out. Anyway, at this point, Magneto shows up to take over the magnetic machine that Whitman has been working on and throws both Whitman and Norris in a dungeon. This brings us to Avengers issue 48 where we see Whitman finally come to and make his way to a chamber that he was looking for. But before we find out what he's looking for, he says, how well I recall the day when I first made that vow, as he recounts the day his uncle fought Iron Man and fell. We then see flashbacks of his uncle Nathan after his fight with Iron Man. We learn that his uncle survived, but barely. He was able to hit branches on his way down, which helped break his fall so that he fell into the water downstream. We then see his uncle with several broken bones make his way to a phone saying, I must call someone I trust. But there's only one person who's ever meant anything to me, which we find out is his nephew, Dr. Dane Whitman. He then calls and says, please get here. It's a matter of life and death. Everything is starting to go black. When Whitman gets there, he picks up his uncle and carries him to a bed while thinking, I knew that he was a wanted criminal, not that he was the powerful villain known as the Black Knight. And it was on that day, as my only relative laid down before me, that the strangest of vows was made. It's at this point we see Whitman's uncle say, I know I was wrong, boy, but it's too late for me now, but it's not too late for you. You must swear to use my researchers for good, as I use them for evil. Whitman replies, I will, Uncle Nathan. I promise you that. One day you will be remembered not as a man who died a criminal, but one who lived as a benefactor of mankind. A few days after his uncle's death, we see Whitman holding his uncle's lance, saying, It's amazing. I always thought my uncle was only a biologist. Yet, this beam shooting lance of his has an intimate knowledge of other sciences as well. And if I should use some of my own skill on it, at which point Whitman says, I'll do it. Professor Nathan Garrett's genius shall not die with him. The Black Knight shall live again. Whitman says, Then followed long, intense months of research as I poured over the carefully recorded recorded secrets of my uncle, making them my own. I even managed to create a second Newton wing stallion, much swifter and more powerful than the one used by the villainous Black Knight. We're then finally brought back to the present where we see Whitman in his chamber as we find out what he's looking for is the Black Knight armor. Whitman then says, so the time has come. I must don the improved armor I've developed and redeem the name of Black Knight. Then we see him sporting his new improved Black Knight armor for the first time. At which point the comic tells us, and with these ringing words, yet another name is added to the proud roll call of dedicated superheroes, or is it? Stick around, Hollowed One, and see. But obviously we know, yes, another name was indeed added to the proud ranks of the superheroes known as the Black Knight. But there you have it, my friends. That's how Dane Whitman became the Black Knight. So now it's time to look at story arcs and publication history. 
Almost immediately after the Black Knight's introduction, he joined the Avengers. You see, like I mentioned in the origin segment, Whitman's uncle Nathan used the Black Knight moniker to be a villain. And because of this, once Whitman took over the Black Knight mantle, he too was thought of as a villain. But he used this to his advantage to infiltrate the Masters of Evil, which are a group of supervillains who fight the Avengers. Once he infiltrates the Masters of Evil, as they think he's a villain, he's able to help the Avengers defeat them, which in turn earns him the respect of the Avengers. But not only does he earn the Avengers respect, they're so impressed that they ask him to become an Avenger. But he's all like, no, not right now, and goes to England as he inherited a castle there. Now this is where things get really interesting. While Whitman is in the castle he inherited, he is contacted by the ghost of his ancestor, Sir Percy Scandia, aka the original Black Knight. Through talking to his ancestor, Whitman is deemed worthy of inheriting and wielding the Ebony Blade. The Ebony Blade is a sword that can literally cut through anything. To drive that point home, in the King and Black Symbiote Spider-Man miniseries, Merlin himself said that Null, and all the symbiotes for that matter, are vulnerable to the Ebony Blade, and that it may very well be the key to defeating Null himself. That's right, this sword is so freaking powerful, Merlin said it could take down the symbiote god. Anyway, after Whitman obtains the Ebony Blade, he then goes back to America, only to see that Kang the Conqueror is having his way with the Avengers, so to speak, as Kang has been given the power to control every Avenger by the Grand Master. We actually went over this in our History of Kang episode we did a while back, which you could find right here. But since the Black Knight wasn't an Avenger, having previously rejected the invitation, Kang could not control the Black Knight, so he was able to defeat Kang and free the Avengers from his power. After this, the Avengers are like, hey man, we asked, you weren't ready, but come on, join us, become an Avenger. And this time, the Black Knight accepts. Sometime after this, the Black Knight would join the Defenders. But while on the team, he was seemingly killed by the Enchantress, who kissed him and turned him into stone. While out of commission or thought to be dead, Valkyrie would use the Ebony Blade and his flying horse. What? Come on. It's comics. Most characters don't die, and Black Knight was no exception. It was later revealed that his soul was sent back to the 12th century, where he would inhabit the body of one of his great ancestors. And the crappy part is he stayed there for quite some time until the Avengers eventually rescued him by going back in time themselves to bring him back to the future, but actually the present. I just really wanted to say back to the future. After this, we get the Under Siege story where the Black Knight leaves the Avengers when he finds out that his Ebony Blade has a blood curse attached to it. Essentially, every time the Ebony Blade draws blood, it twists his mind. But he seeks the help of Doctor Strange, who was able to remove the curse. He then rejoins the Avengers who have just come under siege from the Masters of Evil who have just reformed. After this, the Black Knight went on to destroy the Supreme Intelligence, which is the collective of the greatest Kree minds in history and is the living embodiment of power. Now, this next part of Black Knight's history is probably what is most important in relation to the MCU, because in the comics, the Black Knight and the Eternal Cersei eventually form a romantic relationship. The relationship is so serious, they end up forming a special bond by sharing a mental link that the Eternals use as a form of marriage, and a bond they call Gon Joseph. This is no doubt why the Black Knight is making his MCU debut in the Eternals film because of his romantic connection to Cersei. Now, normally an Eternal would not be able to enter into a marriage or Gon Josin, as they call it, with a human. But Icarus, who at the time was acting as the primary Eternal, allowed it to happen as he saw their unity as a way to possibly help stabilize Cersei's unstable mental state. Because you see, unknown to the Black Knight, Cersei was mentally unstable because of the secret actions of a mystery man called Proctor. And later on, we find out that Proctor was a version of the Black Knight from an alternate reality who came all the way to the main Marvel Universe to seek revenge on the Cersei of that reality. Essentially, Cersei from his reality dumped him, and Proctor was pissed, so he came to seek revenge on the main Marvel Universe Cersei. After all this comes to light, Cersei from the main Marvel Universe left to an alternate universe known as the Ultraverse, thus tearing her and the Black Knight's bond. Since the Black Knight still had feelings for her, he followed her there, where he ultimately becomes a leader of Ultra Force of the Ultraverse. Now, for the sake of time, we're going to skip all the way to the 2015 Black Knight series written by Frank Thierry. This is the perfect series for someone wanting to start reading the Black Knight for the first time. First off, it's only five issues. And second, it does a great job out the gate giving you a retelling of the Black Knight's origin. Going as far as to start from the very, very beginning with Iron Man fighting Whitman's evil uncle, Nathan Garrett, which we talked about earlier in Origins. We even get panels of the Black Knights before Whitman and the first Black Knight fighting alongside King Arthur. It's pretty dope. As for the plot of the series, it deals with Dane Whitman's addiction to the Ebony Blade as it grows stronger and he finds himself in the aptly named Weird World. We see what brought him to go to this planet and why he entered this dangerous realm. Again, it's only five issues and it's a solid read. If you want to start reading Black Knight, this is the perfect place to start. But with that said, let's move on to powers and abilities. Now, this may be a surprise to some of you, but the Black Knight doesn't have any crazy superhuman abilities. But he does possess enhanced physical skills when mentally bonded to Cersei as a pen dragon. He possesses the ability to see through magic illusions. Now, even though he doesn't have superhuman strength or anything, he is an exceptional fighter, specifically when it comes to swordsmanship, as he is a knight after all. Which also means he's very skilled at riding horses. But aside from physical abilities, he's incredibly intelligent, especially in the areas of science and physics. He also has proficient tactical and strategic skills. As for weapons, he can pretty much wield any melee weapon with 
expertise. His original weapon was a lance, which he inherited from his criminal uncle, Nathan Garrett. But by far his most notable and iconic weapon is the Ebony Blade, which is a powerful but cursed sword forged from a meteorite that is capable of cutting through virtually any substance. Now with that said, let's explain the curse a little more, even though I touched on it earlier. The blood curse, as it's called, drives its wielder closer to madness every time the sword draws blood. Meaning every time Dane Whitman attacks or kills someone with it, he's driven closer to madness, and because of this, he's given up the sword in the past. It's something I can't wait to see them explain and use in the MCU. But even though the Ebony Sword is by far the coolest and most known weapon he uses, he's also been given the Sword of Light and the Shield of Night by the Lady of the Lake. Essentially, the shield can absorb energy, and the sword can emit the energy the shield absorbs. They work hand in hand in unison to basically redirect all attacks. But now that you got an idea of his powers and abilities, let's move on to reading recommendations. Check out The Avengers issues 47 and 48, Atlas Era, Black Knight, Yellow Claw, Masterworks Volume 1, and Black Knight and the Fall of Dane Whitman. That should be enough to get you guys started. And that's going to bring today's episode of Variant to a close, but if you enjoyed today's video, be sure to check out this one right here. And if you like all of our content, subscribe, like, and comment. It always helps the channel grow. But other than that, I'll see your lovely faces next time when I talk about all things comics.